Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the first event of the Central Wisconsin Book Festival. My name is Chad Daly, and I am one of the organizers of the festival. Uh, we're very happy to have you with us and very happy to have Doug Tallamy with us this evening to talk about nature's best hope and backyard conservation. Um, all credit goes to the Master Gardener Program of Marathon County, who um, initially contacted Doug to set this up. Um, and so we're very thankful for their support. A um, few things before we get going, you'll notice everybody's muted. Um, we do have video going, but Doug will have some things to share from his screen. So you won't be looking at everybody else while all of this is going on. Um, and let's see, somebody is, let's mute all. We're going to mute everybody. One moment. Um, just a reminder, if, um, if you wouldn't mind, um, down at the bottom of your screen, there is an option to mute your audio. Please do that. <laughs> In fact, uh, yeah. And okay. All right. So before we get going, uh, we just have a short one minute video uh, to share with everybody. And then I will introduce Doug and we will get things underway. All right. One moment. Welcome to the 2020 Central Wisconsin Book Festival. This week of amazing events is possible only because of the support of our sponsors, which include the Marathon County Public Library, the Friends of the Marathon County Public Library, the MCPL Foundation, the Community Arts Grant Program of the Community Foundation of North Central Wisconsin. With funds provided by the Wisconsin Arts Board, which is a state agency, the Community Foundation, and the BA and Esther Greenheck Foundation, the Wisconsin Institute for Public Policy and Service, the Merco Foundation Fund, Wisconsin Public Radio, the Master Gardener Program of Marathon County, North Central Area Congregations Organized to Make an Impact, or Naomi, and Yonkey Bookstore. Thank you to all of our friends and partners who make the Wisconsin Book Festival possible. And we thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much. Okay, and with that, we will welcome Doug. Doug Tallamy is professor in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware, where he has authored 95 research publications and has taught insect-related courses for 40 years. His book, Bringing Nature Home, How Native Plants Sustain Wildlife in Our Gardens, was published by Timber Press in 2007. The Living Landscape, co-authored with Rick Dark, was published in 2014. And Doug's new book that he'll be discussing this evening, Nature's Best Hope, was published by Timber Press in February of this year. Among, the, among his awards are the Garden Club of America Margaret Douglas Medal for Conservation and the Tom Dowd Jr. Award of Excellence, the 2018 AHS B.Y. Morrison Communication Award, and the 2019 Cynthia Westcott Scientific Writing Award. And with that, welcome to you, Doug. We'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much for being here this evening. We really appreciate you joining us. Well, thanks very much. I, it's a pleasure to be here. I want to talk tonight about uh, my idea of what nature's best hope is. But before I do that, I want to, I want to talk about what happened last fall not sure if it happened uh, out where you folks are, but uh, the East Coast anyway, from Massachusetts all the way down to Georgia, and at least as far west as the Mississippi, was a mast year for the red oak group. What that means is all the red oaks got together and decided they would make their acorns in the same year, and they did, and this is what it looked like in a lot of places. Well, if you are enter easily entertained, like I am, maybe you took one of those acorns and just stared at it, and if you stared long enough, you might have seen this little guy start to chew his way out of the egg quarry. It was obviously an insect larva chewing, and 
squeezing through the little hole, kind of looked like the Pillsbury Doughboy, finally plopped down on the ground. This is a very dangerous time for this insect larva because it, is, uh, it tastes good. It is full of protein, full of fat, and it's got to protect itself very quickly. So uh, more squirming and wiggling and down underneath the ground it goes. Only takes about 30 seconds for that larva to disappear. Once it's underground, it stretches and forms a little chamber, stretches in all different directions and converts itself into a pupa. And then it stays there for two years. After two years, it comes out as an acorn weevil. Now, a lot of people think weevils have big noses because it certainly looks like they do but that's actually an extension of the head capsule and their mouth parts are way down here uh, at the end of that extension. And they use those to chew a hole down into the center of the acorn. And the female turns around, lays an egg and the larva crawls down. And that's how they get into the center of the acorn where they develop in safety. Now you might wonder uh, why the, the uh, acorn weevil spends two years underground. And the answer is it takes uh, red oak acorns 18 years, 18 years, 18 months to complete development. Uh, so if they came out the very next year, they would not have uh, enough acorns to complete their development. I'm having a little trouble advancing here, but we, we've got it. Okay, that leaves, of course, when the weevil leaves the acorn, it leaves a hole. Uh, it is truly a vacuum and nature abhors vacuums. So there actually are specialized insects that use those uh, acorn holes. Uh, particularly in the genus Temnothorax, these are temn three species of, of ants that live inside the vacated uh, acorns um, and the entrance hole was made by those those weevils. When they find a new uh, acorn, they get very excited because they're going to move their entire colony into that that hole uh, and they do that almost immediately. It takes about 30 minutes. They're moving from their old dilapidated acorn into this one. Everybody gets involved carrying eggs, carrying larvae, they carry the queen and then they post a guard at the hole here, make sure nobody else comes in and they will live in this new acorn for uh, the next two years until it falls apart. Well, about this time, my wife says, uh, what's your point? What are you trying to tell us? My point is that that is a specialized interaction that occurs in my yard. This is another one right here, the, the um, mutualistic interaction between jays and oaks. The oaks produce acorns, jays disperse them and then live off those acorns over the winter. Nature is built from millions of these types of interactions. So for example, if you want to have pileated woodpeckers living in your yard, you need to have lots of carpenter ants because that is what they feed their young. They rear their young on carpenter ants and you're not going to have carpenter ants unless you have the large trees that make those carpenter ants. You won't have this bee, Andrena facilia, unless you have uh, the plant facilia. Come on, and there you go. That is the only pollen that they, um, that bee can actually rear its young on. Very specialized. As a matter of fact, there are lots of specialist bees out there. There are 13 spe species of bees in the upper Midwest that cannot reproduce unless they have the pollen of various species of helianthus, various species of sunflower. That is the only pollen they can rear their young on. You're not gonna have Baltimore checker spots unless you have white turtle head and on and on and on. So nature is a series of these specialized relationships, but today these types of relationships, nature itself is on the ropes. And it's on the ropes because we did not take Teddy Roosevelt's advice seriously. Way back in 1908, Teddy heard that the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon, he looked out over the edge and he said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the process of creating the Grand Canyon National Park. Uh, well, today that of course is not an option in most places. There's only about 5% of the US or the lower 48 states anyway, that's anything close to uh, uh, its original pristine ecological state. And that's because we have logged the country a number of times, we have tilled it, we have drained it, we've grazed it, we've got 770 million acres of rangeland, we've paved it or otherwise developed it. We have straightened our rivers and dammed them, and you can spell that any way you want. We have polluted our skies and changed our, our uh, weather, our climate for centuries to come. We've drained our aquifers. We've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents, many of which are now running amok in our natural areas, changing the composition of our native plant communities. In short, we have carved up the natural world 
into uh, remnants, tiny remnants of its former self. And each one of those remnants is too small and too isolated from each other to sustain the species that run the ecosystems that support us. You might wonder why we've done all those things. Well, we thought the earth, our nest was so, so big, we could foul it forever and there wouldn't be any consequences. And of course, uh, that was wrong. And we're now getting headlines in a fairly regular clip that reminds us uh, we've created some serious problems. This one came two years ago. The insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of, of life on Earth? And it's referring to global insect decline, followed by uh, this study that, that says North America has lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. That's a third of the North American bird population. The UN uh, predicts that we will lose a million species in the next 20 years to extinction. I mean, gone. By the way, you know, these are headlines and we read them and say, oh, that's too bad. That's not an option, folks. I mean, they might as well say we're going we're gonna to lose oxygen in the next 20 years. It is simply not an, an option. So I could go on about the, the pox that we humans have delivered upon our environment, thus upon all of our houses, but that's, that's not what this talk is about. This talk is about a cure for that pox. It's a cure that will require small efforts from lots of people. Uh, but those small efforts will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to everybody. Let's return to this headline, Insect Apocalypse is Here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Uh, well, Edward O. Wilson, E.O. Wilson, Harvard Emeritus, um, the most famous entomologist of our times, probably of all times. Um, he has started disciplines on his own. He writes a book a year, even though he's 92 at this point. I could give an entire lecture on the accomplishments of, of E.O. Wilson. But he told us what it would mean if uh, we were to lose insects. In this paper, The Little Things That Run the World, very simply, he said, life as we know it depends on insects. If they were to disappear, so would most of the flowering plants. And if most of the flowering plants disappeared, that would not only change the physical structure of, of uh, terrestrial Earth, but it would seriously alter energy flow through our, our uh, habitats. And that's the energy we're talking about, the food webs, the energy that moves through food webs that supports our animals, our amphibians, our reptiles, our birds, and our mammals, they would all disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the Earth would rot because of the loss of, of insect decomposers that, that today rapidly turn over nutrients. You'd only have bacteria and fungi left. And of course, humans uh, would, would not survive any of those changes. There's good news though, and that is none of that has to happen. We can save our insects. We can save our birds. We can save nature itself. But we're gonna have to get serious about changing the way we landscape in order to do that. And that's what I wanna talk about tonight. Why do we have to, to essentially save nature? Well, because we are products of nature. We're totally dependent on healthy ecosystems that produce what we call ecosystem services. Here are just a few services produced by plants. How about the production of oxygen? I think we all still need that. Plants clean our water and slow its journey to the sea where it becomes too salty to use. They capture carbon, enormously important ecosystem service these days. Pull carbon out of the atmosphere, lock it up in their tissues, uh, and even more important, they pump it into the ground through their root system. The, our soils are brown or black because of the carbon that plants have deposited in them, where it's then out of harm's way. Plants build topsoil and hold it in place. They prevent floods, they dampen severe weather, and many other things. What do animals do for plants? Well, they provide those pest control services that, that uh, keep our plants from being destroyed. They pollinate um, nearly 90% of our flowering plants they disperse plant seeds, absolutely necessary, and many other things. Point is that designing landscapes that destroy the production of these types of ecosystem services is no longer an option. It never was a good option. Uh, but today with 7.8 billion people on the planet, it's, it's, it's really not, a, not an option. We need as many ecosystem services as we can get and we need them everywhere. There were visionaries through the ages uh, who recognized that, that uh, we humans did not have a healthy relationship with the land that supports us. And Aldo Leopold was one of the most vocal uh, in the uh, early 1900s. He wrote uh, a number of books and uh, said a lot of important things. And this was one of them. The oldest task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. 
Uh, and, and in general, we humans have not been good at that. There are some indigenous peoples that uh, learned how to do that fairly well. But particularly our Western culture, our extractive culture, take as much from the earth as fast as we can. Um, and it doesn't matter what happens after that. Suggests that, that uh, uh, we don't have a, a healthy relationship with uh, what Aldo called the land. So he had a dream. The dream, his dream was to develop what he called a uh, land ethic. Uh, and he wrote about this in Sand County Almanac. I mean, you people know this, I know, but his dream is that we would learn to, to use the land the way we needed to. We could farm it and lumber it and, and graze and mine and hunt on it. But we would learn to do that without destroying local ecosystems. And that's what he called developing a land ethic. Uh, what he never wrote about uh, and it's curious to me that he didn't, was developing a land ethic where we actually live. Uh, and I'm not sure why that was, but uh, I, I suspect it's because the notion that humans and nature cannot coexist in the same place at the same time was so deeply embedded uh, in his, the culture of his day. It's still embedded in our culture that Otto Leopold didn't even recognize it as an option. What I wanna talk about tonight though is, is that living with nature not only is an option, I'm going to argue that it is now the only viable option that is left to us. You know, in the past, conservation has worked exclusively where people aren't. They wanted to conserve what remained. We now have to, to reverse that. We still wanna conserve what remains, not that much remains, but we also now need to save nature where people are because we're pretty much everywhere. So we need to find ways for nature to thrive in human dominated landscapes. It's, an, it's, it's a new approach. Where are we gonna start? Well, one thing we cannot ignore is private property. 85.6% of the US east of the Mississippi is privately owned. Um, the West has more public property, but even so it's still uh, about 76, 77% of the entire country is privately owned. We cannot ignore private holdings and only do conservation and public property if we wanna succeed, because that would leave just, just two, um, the, the areas we can serve would be too small and again, too isolated from each other. Uh, to be able to sustain those species forever. You know, we're not talking about sustaining things for five years. We're talking about sustaining functional ecosystems forever. But there are uh, a number of opportunities for conservation that we have not been thinking about. Land that is out there that we've used, uh, but we don't think of them as opportunities for conservation. How about power and pipeline rights of ways? We're actually starting to, to use them as, as good conservation areas, but we've got a long way to go. Railroad rights of ways, roadsides. Uh, there are millions of acres in, in those types of areas. Golf courses, two million acres. Airports, three million acres. The Denver airport is twice the size of Manhattan. We're talking about big, big areas here. And then all the places we live, both in rural areas and suburbia and, and urban centers, uh, hundreds of millions of acres there. Those are all possibilities for conservation. If you add up just those areas, that's 599 million acres. How big is that? Well, that's bigger than Vermont, plus New Jersey, plus Maine, plus Virginia, plus New York, Georgia, Florida, Oklahoma, Montana, California, plus Texas. Add up all of those spaces, still less than 599 million acres. So not having a place to do conservation is not, not the issue. We can do it pretty much anywhere. What are we talking about when we're talking about doing conservation? We're really talking about restoration. We're talking about putting nature back together again. So we have to start with the building blocks. All species don't contribute to ecosystem function equally. So we've got to start with the species that other species depend on so that we can build um, all aspects of, of nature. And one of the most important parts of natural systems is building viable food webs. We have to take energy from plants. Remember, plants are capturing the, excuse me, capturing the energy from the sun uh, and turning it into food. Uh, and then that is the energy that keeps everything else alive on the planet. But if that energy, energy stays locked up in plants, um, then we don't have viable food webs. Well, it turns out that caterpillars are the most important group of animals that are transferring energy from plants to other animals. Most animals do not eat plants directly. They eat something that ate plants, and that something is insects, and most of those insects are caterpillars. Uh, so uh, research has shown that caterpillars transfer more energy from plants than any other type of animal, more than elephants or any, anything else. So if they were to disappear from our ecosystems, um, the impact would be enormous. 
Let's start with a little example from Carolina chickadees, uh, and they're not special. Most birds are doing this. Um, during the winter, they're seed eaters. They're not migrants. They, they live uh, at least 50% of their diet in the winter is, is seeds. But when they're rearing their young, their young cannot eat seeds, so they switch to insects. And it turns out that uh, in a healthy environment, they will rear their young exclusively on caterpillars. And again, they are not exceptions. 96% of our terrestrial birds are rearing their young on insects, and most of those insects are caterpillars. And here's a little bit of data to, to uh, support that, that statement. Um, this came from a study that my uh, grad student Ashley Kennedy completed uh, two years ago, last year. She uh, conducted a citizen science project where she had people all over the country take pictures of birds as they were carrying prey items back to the nest. Uh, and, and they sent the pictures to Ashley. She got about 7,000 pictures. Uh, and the idea was to identify what the prey item was in the beak and then um, construct the um, frequency with which different types of prey are fed to different types of birds during the, during the breeding season. So the green bars that you see there are the percentage of the nestling diet uh, that was caterpillars. You're looking at 20 families of, of common birds in, in the U.S. And in 16 of those 20 families, caterpillars dominate the nestling diet. So again, imagine what would happen if we lost our caterpillars. 16 of the 20 common bird families would have a lot of trouble reproducing. So something is special about caterpillars. What is it? Uh, well, actually, there's several things special uh, about caterpillars compared to other insects. And, and um, one of the most obvious is that they're relatively soft prey items. If you think of this caterpillar as a, uh, a little sausage with a thin wrapper, the thin wrapper is exoskeleton, it's cuticle, it is undigestible, and birds don't want a lot of cuticle uh, because they can't digest it. And then it wraps around uh, a lot of good food, a lot of protein, a lot of fat. And if it's soft, that means uh, the parent bird can stuff it down the throat of their offspring without fear of injuring them. And if you've ever watched a parent rear their young, uh, that's what they do. They're pretty rough. Their beak is like a plunger. They just stuff it down there. Uh, caterpillars are also relatively large prey items. One medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. And some of our smaller birds do chase aphids around, but uh, do you want to chase 200 aphids or get one caterpillar? As I said, they're nutritious, high in protein, high in fat, low percentage of chitin compared to many other types of insects, particularly beetles, uh, which are uh, not like little sausages, they're like little tanks. And it turns out that caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. Now I mentioned carotenoids, um, not because I love organic chemistry, uh, but because I'm a vertebrate and you're a vertebrate and birds are vertebrates. And vertebrates cannot make their own carotenoids, yet carotenoids are essential components of our diets. Only plants make carotenoids and we have to get them from plants. And that's why my, my wife, Cindy, says that I have to eat my, my carrots to get my, my beta carotene. I have to eat my tomatoes to get my lycopene, my whatever that is, to get my, my lutein. And she makes sure that, that I get all of those things because uh, they stimulate my immune system. And I can't think of a better time to have a very strong immune system. Carotenoids are antioxidants. They protect our DNA from, from oxidative damage. They improve color vision. When your mother said, eat your carrots, you will see better. She was right. She didn't know she was right, but it turns out she was right. Uh, improves sperm vitality, improves sexual attractiveness. Now we're talking about uh, birds like this uh, prothonotary warbler male who's had access to lots of lutein's. And he's taken those lutein's and made pigments out of them, put them in his feathers. Uh, and the brighter yellow he is, the more ladies he attracts. Well, where are the birds getting their, their carotenoids from? They're getting them from the prey items that they eat, of course, but carotenoid content across different invertebrate prey uh, is not at all equal. These first two bars here are types of caterpillars. They have by far the most carotenoids. Third bar is uh, orthopteroids, things like crickets and grasshoppers and katydids. Uh, here are the adult caterpillars, way down here, uh, the, the uh, moths and the butterflies they have far less carotenoid uh, content because they're not eating green leaves. Um, here's the earthworm way over here. Early bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he, when he gets the worm. Does this influence uh, prey choice? Well, it looks like it does. Ashley did another study where she put GoPro cameras on the roofs of bluebird houses, and those cameras took a picture once every second. 
and she had a lot of GoPro cameras and a lot of Bluebird houses and she did it for three years. The object was to capture uh, pictures of the birds as they flew into the, to the nest or sat on the box carrying the, the prey item. And it turned out she had to go through a million pictures to, um, to come up with this data set. But again, she ended up with about over 7,000 pictures where she got good photos of the, the prey item. And it turns out there's a very good relationship between the prey that are taken most frequently, and that was caterpillars, and their carotenoid content more than anything else, followed by those orthopteroids. Uh, and then everything else was nestled down here in, in the corner. So all this uh, suggests that, um, that it, it's starting to look like caterpillars are not optional parts of bird diets. They are essential parts of, of bird diets. So we want, to, we want to have enough caterpillars for, for birds, but we don't know how many enough caterpillars are. How many do they need? Is one or two enough to give them what they need? Uh, well, let's ask that question again for the Carolina chickadee because a very nice study was done a long time ago um, looking at the number of caterpillars that chickadees need to reproduce. Uh, and it turns out they need a whole bunch, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to just to reach the point where they fledge um, and that depends on the number of chickadees in the nest. Uh, and then the parents continue to feed them caterpillars another 24 days after they fledge, but they're flying all around and nobody can count them. Um, and, and so if you want chickadees breeding in your yard, they're only gonna forage about 50 meters from the nest. They're not gonna fly five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot to get what they need. So you need thousands and thousands of caterpillars in your yard if you're going to support breeding from a bird like a chickadee. And chickadees again are not not exceptions. There's data from lots of species where they need thousands of caterpillars to make it. Well, when we design uh, landscapes that do not have the necessary amount of, of insects for birds to be able to breed, um, there's uh, growing evidence that that is one of the major factors causing bird declines. Uh, we took a look at the, the data that Rosenberg et al used to come up with the, the decline of birds, 3 billion birds lost in the last 50 years. And it turns out that the birds that are declining, uh, they're not declining equally across species. The birds that require insects at some point of their life history are declining far more than the birds that don't require insects. As a matter of fact, the birds that don't require insects, things like the, uh, the doves and the finches that can actually breed without insects, they actually gained uh, a few million um, individuals per species, but the birds that required insects uh, lost on average 10 million individuals per, per species. This is not cause and effect, but it sure suggests there's a strong relationship between um, having insects in the environment and how well birds are doing. So I'm concluding that we need to landscape for caterpillars. It's sure not, not gonna hurt to do that. Uh, but again, that's not how we've designed our landscapes in the past. So how do we do that? How do we add caterpillars to our, our landscapes? Well, we add caterpillars by, by uh, adding the plants that make those caterpillars. There is a catch. And that catch is all plants don't make caterpillars. So we have to add the ones that, that do. It turns out that most caterpillars are very fussy about the types of plants they're going to eat. They're what we call host plant specialists, and nothing illustrates it better than the monarch uh, butterfly. That's a caterpillar you see here. Um, you're not gonna rear monarchs on soybeans or corn or crepe myrtles or boxwoods um, or, or any of the other Asian plants or agricultural plants that we have loaded our landscapes with. There's only one thing that monarchs are going to uh, grow on, and that is milkweeds, absolutely essential. Uh, and again, they're not exceptions. Most, 90% of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. Why? Because plants don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they have loaded their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals. Secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a really effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And that's why it's green out there. It's not because there's no insects out there that want to eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat those plants. They are too well defended chemically. And if you don't believe me, after this talk, go outside and eat a plant. See if you like it. You're not going to like it. Uh, the, <laughs> there's a reason it's hard to get our kids to eat vegetables. They inherently know that they're toxic. Well, we do know that insects eat, eat plants. Um, so how do they do that? 
how do they get around those chemical defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. Again, most, and it turns out it's about 90% 90, 90 of the insects that eat plants have developed very specialized relationships with particular plant lineages for which they have developed the adaptations that allow them to circumvent their chemical defenses. They develop enzymes, they can store and excrete and, and detoxify those compounds. They develop behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that allow them to minimize their exposure to those compounds. But it takes a, a long period of, of uh, exposure to those plant lineages for all these adaptations to fall into place. It does not happen overnight. All I'm saying is that plant choice matters. When we're trying to reestablish landscapes uh, um, in our human dominated spaces, uh, we have to choose the plants that will allow us to, to do that. And I'm gonna give you three examples of how this works. I'm gonna start with, with uh, our, our own house here. I am sitting right now up in this, this window. Um, we have 10 acres in Oxford, Pennsylvania. And this is what it looked like when we moved in. It had been uh, in agriculture for 300 years before we moved in. The last bit of agriculture was uh, simply mowing it for hay. Um, most of the, of the uh, property had been out of mowing for a couple of years before we moved in. And of course, what did move in after that was the uh, invasive species from Asia. Um, that's my wife, Cindy, and she's getting ready to get rid of multiflora rose and oriental bittersweet and Japanese honeysuckle and bush honeysuckle and miscanthus and calorie pear and, and uh, uh, privet and they're all there. Porcelain berry um, from 10 acres. You know, you look at that and say, oh, that's impossible. I can't do that. Little skinny Cindy did it and, and uh, it, it really, it is possible. You just start at the corner and, and push those guys back. What was I doing? I was putting plants back and I started with the plants that I knew supported caterpillars that I wanted to take pictures of. Um, it became a little game, big game actually. Um, and this is one and uh, I, I brought in in the early days. I wanted to take a picture of the Canadian outlet. Well, I've never, never seen a Canadian outlet um, or it's, it's adult that looks just like, like a leaf. But I knew they only ate meadow rue and we didn't have any meadow rue and I still don't know of any meadow rue around us here. So I got some meadow root seeds, planted them. Uh, they germinated, they did fine, they grew quickly, but I, I thought it would take years to attract the Canadian outlet, if ever. Uh, maybe they had to come down from Canada. So I didn't go out and check my meadow root, but after about a month and a half, two months, I did go out and look at it and it was practically defoliated with Canadian outlets. Somehow they had found it right away. And now I have a, a uh, thriving population of both meadow root and Canadian outlets. So that was a big success. Another success here, the goldenrod stowaway. I wanted that beautiful moth so I could take its picture. Uh, well, it's, it's a misnomer, it has nothing to do with goldenrod. Um, it is a specialist on this plant, ditch daisy, Biden's aristosa. We didn't have any Biden's aristosa, but we do now. I, there's a population in a power line cut uh, about 15 miles away. I got some seeds, brought them here. Uh, it took about a year for the, uh, the goldenrod stowaway to find it, but now we have a good population of, of both. I wanted Hackberry Empress because it's a, it's a butterfly that ought to be uh, on our property. It should be here. But of course, they require hackberries. They require celtus. We didn't have any. I planted some. I planted seven. I went out and looked at one of our, our uh, celtus trees this June on one branch. There were nine Hackberry Emperor caterpillars. Another big, big success. Although that took, what, three or four years for them to find it. I did not plant goldenrod, came in on its own, and along with it came the things that eat goldenrod, things like the brown hooded owlet, the arcidura flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct sparagnothus, the goldenrod gall moth. This is one I'm waiting for, the goldenrod flower moth. Uh, or it's beautiful, beautiful larvae. Um, this is anticipation. This is like waiting for the, the ketchup to come out of, of the bottle. We've been here 20 years now. We still don't have the goldenrod flower moth. They just don't move around a lot. But one of these days it's going to come and that will be a great day. No more anticipation. Virginia creeper. Planted it for the same reason. I, I wanted to attract Pandora sphinx because I wanted to take that picture and I wanted to take that picture. It's a beautiful moth, but lots of other things came too. The lettered sphinx came, the hog sphinx, the abbot sphinx, all uh, um, dependent on Virginia creeper. Wanted zebra swallowtail. I think it's our prettiest swallowtails, but they're specialists on pawpaws. Uh, so we planted pawpaws. Now the nearest population of zebra swallowtails that we know about is 26 miles away. I didn't know if they'd ever find it, but they did. 
but it took nine years. We had to wait, be patient. Uh, in the meantime, we got the pawpaw sphinx. I didn't know there was a pawpaw sphinx, and we got lots of pawpaws. Wanted the double-toothed prominence, so we planted American elm. I wanted the evening primrose moth, so we planted evening primrose and got to watch them uh, hide by day in the flowers of the evening primrose. It's a lot of fun. And we planted lots of oaks. So these are just, just a, you know, a few representations of, of the things that we put in our, our property. But oaks are certainly the most powerful. This is the Bedford oak. Uh, people argue about whether it's 300 years old or 400 years old. It's enormous. And a lot of people think you need enormous old oaks like this before they start to contribute to your, your yard or before you can enjoy them. I hear people say all the time, I'm not going to plant an oak. I won't live long enough to, to enjoy it. Um, not so, not unless you, you die tomorrow because you can enjoy them right away. I started most of my oak trees as acorns, a few as bare root whips about two feet tall. They all were tiny. And right away they brought uh, creatures like the uh, solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow shouldered moth, the orange headed epicolema, the red wash caterpillar, the yellow vested moth, the orange tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the delightful dagger moth, the pleasant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown bucolatrix, the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panopoda, the laugher, and literally hundreds more moth species have come to use our oaks and they come right away. This is a pin oak that has just germinated, uh, popped its head above, above the leaves. And here's a, a crocus geometer caterpillar eating, eating the leaves um, of that little seedling. So uh, yeah, you don't have to wait hundreds of years. They start contributing almost immediately. This is a picture uh, from the same perspective that I took that first picture. And yes, we have a little lawn there. We're very traditional, but we have put a lot of plants back. And so many moths started to come to use those plants that I made it a goal to take a picture of every species of moth I found on this property. Uh, and I've been doing it for four years now. I am now up to 1,012 species of moths. That is 1,012 species of bird food. Now that's just moths, I haven't gotten to butterflies yet. And because we have so much bird food, we have recorded 55 species of birds breeding on our, our 10 acres. Um, earlier this week, I saw this headline, World Wildlife Fund said two thirds of wildlife have vanished since 1970. Not at our house, not at our house. As a matter of fact, I bet we have increased wildlife by at least two thirds. Um, so, so it works, it works, that's, that's the message here. But I know what you're thinking. Uh, if you don't have 10 acres, it's not gonna work. Will it work in, in a suburban yard that's much smaller? That's a, that's a good question. Let's go to Margie and Dan Terpstra's house in Kirkwood, Missouri. They have 0.6 acres, so less than one acre. They live in the middle of a development uh, and they are surrounded by typical uh, suburban yards with giant lawns and not much else. Well, the big invasive plant in Kirkwood, Missouri is bush honeysuckle. And the first thing they did was get rid of that. And then they planted a lot of native plants and then they put in a water feature they call a bubbler. And then they started to count their birds. And they're up to 149 species of birds that have come to their yard to use the things that they've provided, including 35 warbler species. And just to put that in perspective, we've recorded only eight warbler species at, at our house. And we've got 10 acres. So obviously it works at, at 0.6 acres. But can it work in a tiny urban yard? Let's go to Pam Carlson's house in Chicago. Pam lives uh, right next, she's in Chicago, I mean, right next to the, uh, one of the runways of O'Hare Airport, right next to Kennedy Expressway. There is zero connectivity between Pam's one-tenth of an acre, which is three times smaller than the average lot size in, in North America. No connectivity between that little, little uh, dot of land and any other preserved area. So she truly is an island. Uh, but she put in 60 species of native plants, a water feature, and started counting her birds again. 116 species of birds have used her yard, including a woodcock. So if you haven't seen a woodcock lately, go to Pam's house and, and you'll be able to see one. What about the middle of, of, of a city? You know, 82% of us are, are now supposed to live in, in cities. Well, in 2014, I was looking at this plant, Asclepius tuberosa. Its common name is butterfly weed, but that reminds me we have a serious marketing issue with our native plants. We call them weeds and then wonder why people don't plant them. 
So let's, let's not call this butterfly weed. Let's call it Monarch's Delight. I was looking at Monarch's Delight. And the first thing I saw was this bee, a megachylid bee, leaf cutter bee. Uh, I had not seen this species in quite a while. So that was, that was a, a good day. I know it's a leaf cutter bee because it collects its pollen on its tummy, not on its, its legs. Well, leaf cutter bees have very strict requirements. Um, they need soft leaves nearby because they cut little edges out of those leaves, roll them up into tubes and stuff those tubes full of pollen. And that is what they lay their eggs on. That is how they rear their young. Uh, well, there were red buds right there next to Monarch's Delight. So the, the uh, leaf cutter bees had what they needed. They had nectar, they had pollen, and they had soft leaves. Because there were red buds, uh, queen bumblebees had what they need at this site. Uh, queens, of course, have to do all the work in the beginning of the year. There are no workers yet, so what they need is a lot of early season forage to make that work easy, and then they can start their colonies. And that's exactly what red buds provide. And then I saw a monarch. As a matter of fact, I saw two monarchs, nectaring on monarch's delight. Now, this was 2014. I was excited about this because I had gone all of 2013 without seeing a single monarch. 2013 was the low point of, of the Eastern monarch population. There was only about 3.6% left compared to 1976. Um, so here's one, this was June, by the way, and they don't, monarchs don't usually get to as far north as, as uh, uh, where we live in June. So um, I, was, I was encouraged, it was exciting. And they were there, of course, because they had monarchs to light. They also had other uh, milkweed species available to them. They had, they had nectar and they had a uh, host plant. Do you know where I was? I was on the High Line in the middle of Manhattan. This is what the High Line looks like. It's a, it's a uh, renovated, elevated railroad, abandoned railroad that went right through Manhattan. This, we're, we're looking at 30 feet above the, the uh, you know, the, the paved roads beneath with traffic. Millions of people go to the High Line to enjoy this little strip of, of nature. Uh, it's a top tourist destination. And that's what we're talking about there. That's the extent of the, of the plantings. Um, and not even all of them are, are native, but enough of them are so that, um, that just that little bit of thoughtful native plantings prove to me that we can bring life back even to the most isolated places. If we can bring it back to the middle of Manhattan, um, we can do it pretty much anywhere. But there's, there's four keys uh, to successful renovation that I want to talk about today. And the first one is we really have to think about shrinking the area that is in lawn. We have over, 20, over 40 million acres of lawn in the U.S. And that's actually an old statistic. I don't know how big it is now, but I'm sure it's bigger than that. And that's an area bigger than New England, which is uh, dedicated to this, um, this status symbol. Looks nice, but it's a deadscape. That is not a functioning ecosystem. Imagine what would happen if we cut that area in half. If we took out half the area of lawn, we would still maintain the area that we, that we have. Uh, it, you know, we'd be good, good stewards, our, our neighborhood would still love us, but we're gonna put plants in the other, the other half. If we did that in half the area that's now in lawn, um, that's 20 million acres that we could use to actually create a new national park. If we did it at home, we could call it Homegrown National Park. And that would be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, plus Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, plus Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. Add up all those parks, still less than 20 million acres. And there's some real benefits to building a park right at home. And we've realized a lot of these benefits during this, this pandemic. First of all, you get, to, you get to develop a personal relationship with nature, which is essential if you're gonna to start to care about the natural world. You get to develop that relationship at your own pace, at your own time, when, when you have time, right where you live. You can, you can avoid crowds. It's free, nobody's gonna charge you. It is also never closed. Doesn't matter what pandemic comes down the road, it is not closed no travel hassles, uh, and you get to experience the natural world alone. I don't know how you can develop that personal relationship if you're in a group. You know, we're, we're worried about our kids now who are suffering from, from uh, what Richard Lube calls nature deficit disorder. So we put them on a bus 
30 other kids and a teacher and they go to some natural area and they walk around for an hour and the teacher tells them not to touch anything and then they get back on the bus and, and go home. And that's their experience with the natural world. Uh, I'm sure it's better than nothing, but it's actually an experience with 30 other kids and a teacher that tells them not to touch anything. They need to be able to develop a relationship by themselves, no parental supervision. In other words, they need to know how to, to hunt lizards. And I'm learning this from my, my own granddaughter, Zoe, who happens to live in Hawaii. And her patch of nature is about 10 by 10 feet here. And she's laying in it right now. Um, this is how you hunt lizards. You get on the ground and you crawl very slowly. First, you have to disguise yourself with leaves and sticks so the lizards don't see you coming. And the lizards she's hunting, you can wear your best dress, by the way, that's okay. The lizards she's hunting are anoles, little, little anoles, and she does hunt them, she does catch them. This is a game that she has, has a very serious game, by the way, but she has uh, created it by herself. Uh, and, and I guarantee she will remember hunting lizards uh, until her dying day, even though it's, it's a pretty minimal experience with, with nature. If you want uh, a lot of other uh, options, learning about exposing kids uh, right, right in home settings. Get Nancy Stranisti's Nature Play at Home. It's a book full of ideas of how to expose kids to, to the natural world. So we're gonna shrink the lawn. Uh, the plants we're gonna put back in that lawn, at least some of them, many of them I hope, are gonna be what I call keystone plants. Uh, what's a keystone plant? Well, we have, we have learned that um, they're really just a, a small percentage of our native plants, about 5% of our native plants are making about 75% of the caterpillar food that drives food webs. Uh, in other words, there's a huge difference among our native plants and their productivity, their ability to support food webs. So the question is no longer simply, are natives better than non-natives? On average, they, they certainly are. Uh, but the question really is, do we want ecologically productive plants in our yards or benign plants or, or even worse, ecologically destructive plants? I think the answer is, is obvious. I get emails a couple times a year from somebody saying, don't I know that ginkgos, ginkgo biloba from Asia, grew actually grew in North America 7 million years ago. So this person says, that means they're native, that means they can plant them and everything will be, be great. But remember, this is not our metric anymore. It's not whether they're native anymore, it's whether they're, they're productive. I don't care if ginkgos grew on the moon seven million years ago, they support zero species of caterpillars right now. That's what they look like all the time. So they're there occupying space, but they're not supporting the life around them. Compared to oaks, Oaks are the most powerful genus you can put in your yard in 84% of the counties of North America. Uh, in the mid-Atlantic states, they support 557 species of caterpillars, 557 species of bird food, nationwide, 900 species. Um, there's no other genus of plant that comes come close to doing that. Let's look at the power of, of keystone oaks in my yard. Now, remember, I have, I have taken pictures of 1,012 moss species so far. Out of that 1,012 moth species, 888 have known host plants. And out of the 888 that we know what they eat, 262 uh, use oaks. And we've got 59 genera of native woody plants, native woody plants on our property. And only one of those is the genus Quercus, the oaks. And we have hundreds of genera of herbaceous plants. So oaks left, left, represent less than 2% of our woody plant diversity and way less than 1% of our total plant diversity, but they're supporting close to 30%, 29% of our moth species diversity. Imagine what would happen to the diversity of not just moths, but the birds that eat them on our property if I didn't have keystone oaks. How do you know what the keystone species are in, in your county? Well, you go to Native Plant Finder in the National Wildlife Federation website and you put in your zip code and the ranked list of plants, both woody and herbaceous plants in your county will pop up. And this is what a typical list looks like, um, not just in your area, but a lot of areas. Oaks almost always number one. Uh, notice I say native oaks, native cherries, native willis. You can go to the nursery and you can buy an English oak, you can buy a, a Chinese oak. Um, and a lot of people do just to be different. You can buy, uh, you know, one of the, the uh, Asian cherries, 
the willow people get is typically weeping willow from, from the Middle East. But every time we buy, even though these are related to our, our native plants, every time we buy something that's not native, um, even if it's a congener, we're reducing caterpillar use by 68%. So, so get the natives, get the natives. Um, here are the top producing uh, herbaceous plants, goldenrods uh, uh, always way up there, asters, sunflowers way up there. And these are also the top three in terms of supporting specialist bees. You know, we have 4,000 species of specialist bees. One, or of native bees. 4,000 species of native bees, one species of honeybee. Um, so people worry about the honeybee, but please, let's worry about our 4,000 species of native bees. And, and at least half of them, it's turning out, are highly specialized. They're only gonna reproduce on the pollen of particular plant genera. These guys, these top producers here, are supporting um, a lot of about uh, 35, 40 species of specialist native bees um, in your area. So if you plant for the, the specialists, the generalist bees will come as well because they can use a lot of different a lot of different plants. All right, we're gonna shrink the lawn. We're going to use uh, keystone plants. Uh, and those keystone plants are gonna attract a lot of, of uh, moths to our yard to lay eggs. And then the moths are gonna get killed by our lights. Why do they get killed by our lights? First of all, we don't know why they go to light. So 100 years of studying it, we still don't know why they're attracted to light, but they are. They, they die of exhaustion. They fly around and around and around the light. You've seen that. Uh, then they hit the light and, and die of a collision, or they get incinerated, or they die of dehydration, or a bat comes and picks them off, or it blinds them. Um, best case scenario is that it, it messes up their daily activities so that they, they can't forage and mate and, and reproduce. Um, it's turning out that light pollution is one of the major, major, major causes of insect declines globally. Uh, and that is good news because it's the easiest one to turn around. All you have to do is turn your lights off. I know what you're going to say. I got to have my lights because uh, the bad man will come if I don't have my light on at night. All right, put a motion sensor on your light so it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you're going to notice is how often the bad man does not come. But if you don't want to do that, put a yellow bulb in your, replace that white bulb that's in your security light. Put a yellow bulb in there because yellow wavelengths are far less attractive to uh, insects, particularly moths, than are white wavelengths. And yellow LED wavelengths are the least attractive. If we switched out to yellow LED lights um, overnight, overnight we could save billions of, of insect lives. And we'd save a lot of energy uh, as well. So there's really no good, good reason not to do that. The fourth thing we need to do is, is when we're designing our landscapes is to design them in ways that allows the caterpillars that are on our plants to actually complete their development. What do I mean by that? Well, I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, uh, and oaks in Chester County, Pennsylvania support 511 species of caterpillars. A few of them, like the polyphemus moth, complete their development on the, on the oaks. They, the caterpillars eat the leaves, they uh, spin a cocoon and hang it from one of the branches, then they emerge as an adult and they do it all over again. Everything happens on the tree. Well, I wish everything did that, um, but they don't. 480 species of this 511, 94% drop from the tree and pupate in the soil. They wiggle themselves down in the soil when it's not compacted and, spin, and, and then pupate. Or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that's under the tree. And you see where I'm going with this. We don't have any leaf litter under the tree and we mow and compact our soil to the point where no caterpillar could get underneath there no matter how hard he tries. And this becomes an ecological trap. The adults come in, lay their eggs, appear, the caterpillars develop, fall down and die. And the next generation, there's far fewer of them. Uh, and then pretty soon you don't have any. And that's, that's kind of where we are right, right now. And of course the cement landscape is even uh, less less viable for, for moths. I'm not trying to discourage the use of trees in cities. I'm trying to discourage the use, the profligate use of, of, of cement as a, as a default landscape. That's just, that's laziness. Nobody wants to take care of it. And it wrecks our watersheds too. This is what most people do. Uh, they have a big lawn, they put a tree in the middle of it. Nobody has studied how well caterpillars can complete their development in a situation like this, but I guarantee they can do it better in a situation like this. 
where they have a tree, a layered landscape. Here's a native azalea. They could have a dogwood over here or an amelanchor, um, some under understory tree. Then you've got ferns and ground cover. Any, any caterpillar that drops to the ground here will easily be able to get underground um, and complete its development. Uh, because you're not gonna you're not gonna squish it. You're not gonna you're not gonna mow it. Um, or you can do your spring ephemeral gardening here. Um, again, safe site. Nobody's gonna squish or mow or mow the caterpillar there. Put a, a ground cover in, like your wild ginger, your may apples, or your foam flower. Lots of options. Your ferns, all safe sites. Uh, we've we've learned recently that um, there's room for compromise in our plant choice, and and to me that's real good news. And this is coming from the results of, of uh, another student of mine, Desiree Narango. Um, these people have all left the lab at this point, but she studied chickadee uh, population dynamics in the suburbs of Washington D.C. So in typical suburban yards uh, that were dominated by native native plants. There were no yards that had 100% native plants um, or dominated by introduced uh, uh, ornamental plants, typically from Asia. And there were yards with 100% non-native plants. Uh, and she looked at how well chickadees did in those two different types of landscapes. When she looked at chickadees in the uh, yards that were dominated by non-native plants, she right away found that there were 75% fewer caterpillars in those landscapes. So the amount of chickadee bird food to rear their young was, was reduced by 75%. Those landscapes were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. Uh, now Desiree had, had uh, nest boxes up in all the landscapes. So this, turns out the chickadees came, they looked around and said, there's not enough food here. We're not even gonna try. If they did try, they laid 1.5 fewer eggs in the nest. Um, those clutches were 29% less likely to, to survive uh, to fledging. If they did survive to fledging, they produced 1.2 fewer fledglings and it took them 1.5 days longer to, to get there. And you might say, well, those aren't very big differences, but if you put all that together into a population growth model, this is what you get as a function of the percentage of non-native plant biomass in your landscape, from no non-native plants to 100%. This dotted line is replacement rate. This is the rate at which the population has to make babies in order to replace the adults that die every year. If you make babies uh, with the, at the same rate that the adults die, you have a sustainable population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking either. If you make more babies than adults die, you have a growing population. If you make fewer, um, in other words, more adults are dying, you've got a shrinking population. And right here is where those lines overlap. When you have about 30% non-native plant uh, biomass or 70% native plant biomass. So when you have 70% native plant biomass, um, you can actually have, there's some yards where we actually had uh, growing populations, but it was, it was sustainable. But if you had more than 30% than non-native plant biomass, you had a, a, uh, an unsustainable situation. Well, this is exciting to me for two reasons. First of all, this is the first time that this has been measured anywhere for any bird. So if anybody's doubting that your plant choice actually impacts other things, um, this data set ought to convince you. Uh, but it also suggests that this area is an area for compromise. And that's good news to me. You can have your ginkgo, you can have your crepe myrtle, you can have your box, boxwood, as long as it's less than 30% of the plant biomass in, in your yard. And as long as it's not an invasive species. You can't have your Bradford pear, you can't have your burning bush or the other things that escape like crazy. Um, but that, but it, it is good news to me because um, if my message was you can have no non-native plants at all, nobody would be listening. We all love our, our beautiful non-native plants. Can we use native plantings in formal designs? Of course we can. Somebody sent me this, this email uh, early in the spring and I, I just wasn't paying attention to who it was. So if it was one of you, I apologize. I've lost track of your name, but uh, it's the land manager of this landscape. And what he's doing is sneaking in uh, native plants. And I th his goal is to make them all native without anybody knowing it. Uh, and so he's got, he's got Joe Pye here I'm not gonna call it Joe Pye weed, it's Joe Pye and he's gonna sneak other things and then send me a picture when, when he's done. Just to show that you know, native plants can be used in formal designs. Formality is not a function of the plants and the design, it's a function of the design itself. Our native plants are used in formal designs in Europe all the time. And I guess that's okay because they're non-native plants over there. 
can we get a, a pollinator garden into a typical suburban yard like this without it offending anybody? Of course we can. Just put a little fence around it. That, there's formality right there. We got a lot of species in here. You'll recognize a lot of good, good prairie plants um, that is addressing the needs of a number of species of pollinators. And if everybody did this, we could have much higher populations of native bees in, excuse me, in our suburban landscapes. How about, how about this? Um, it's a much bigger plot. There's no fence around it, but it's formalized. Think the, of the life that is here compared to the life that is not here. This is one of uh, Drew Latham's uh, designs, by the way. Heather Holm, you all know Heather Holm, uh, works with, with bees, writes books on bees. This is what her place looked like when she moved in, one aspect. Uh, and this is what it looked like after she, she uh, fixed it up. She removed the hardscape, removed the lawn, put in native plantings, and now her bees have a lot more forage. So yes, we can do it. Can mun municipalities help us live with nature? Very powerful mechanism here. Um, you all know Minnesota has a cost sharing program, encourage homeowners to, to replace uh, some or, or all of uh, lawn with appropriate prairie plantings, help you pay for it. What a great idea. Um, there are uh, small islands off the coast of Florida that are paying residents to allow burrowing owls to burrow in their front lawns. Burrowing owls are listed species, of course. So this is, this is exactly the way the Endangered Species Act should have been written. It should have been written with carrots rather than sticks. If you have an endangered species on your property, we're gonna pay you to take care of it. Rather than we're gonna, we're gonna make sure you can't do anything with your property and then the person goes out and makes sure they kill it. Uh, Missouri had a, a, um, a bounty on calorie pear, on Bradford pear. If you brought in a, a Bradford pear body, they give you a free tree replacement, another great program. And then of course, there's all the lawn replacement programs in the dry west, California and Arizona, up to $2 per square foot rebate if you get rid of lawn and put in xeric plantings. So uh, I think we've made three missteps in the early years of, of conservation, early years being last century. Well, the first is that we've assumed that nature is important, but it's not essential. It's, you know, we like it, but it, you know, push come to shove, it's always the thing that, that, that goes in favor of something else. Um, I went to the Cincinnati Zoo before the, the virus broke out, and there was this wall-sized poster, which, which to me summarizes our culture's response to wildlife. We like it, we wanna save it, we want future generations to be able to enjoy it, uh, but that suggests nature's there just for entertainment. And if we lose it, we'll lose part of what's entertaining to us. But that's all. Nature's far more than, than uh, enter entertainment. We need to save nature so that we have future generations. It's, it's that simple. Second uh, assumption is that we've assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist together. That's what coexist means, I guess. Uh, but if we restrict conservation efforts to just the untouched areas where we don't have any humans, we've condemned them to failure because again, they'd be too small, too isolated from each other. David Quammen has a, a superb uh, analogy between a Persian rug and uh, an ecosystem. This is a functional Persian rug. This is not 71 Persian rugs. This is 71 rug fragments, none of which function as a Persian rug. And in between each one of those fragments is, is, is no man's land. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. And I hate that terminology because it suggests there are places on planet Earth with no ecological significance. There are certainly places where we've destroyed the ecological significance, but every single square inch of the Earth has ecological significance. And today with our crazy giant human populations on this planet, we need function out of every single square inch. So what we need to do is glue our rug fragments back together again. We've got to, instead of these fragmented uh, um, ecosystems, we've got to stitch them together by putting those powerhouse plants back into no man's land. Not just creating biological carters where plants and animals can move back and forth to viable habitat, but creating viable habitat in between. And this is where we live, this is where we work, it's where we play, to a lesser degree where we farm, which means we're gonna have to live together. We can do it. Our third misstep was, was to leave Earth stewardship to just a few specialists. We didn't see it as an inherent responsibility of every single human being on the planet. And I have no idea why. 
because every single human being on the planet depends entirely on the quality of Earth's ecosystems. Which means, in my book, that means everybody bears responsibility for good Earth stewardship. And, and Native uh, uh, people certainly knew this. Stan Rushworth, a, a Cherokee, Cherokee elder, once said that Western settler mindset was, I have rights. The mindset of indigenous people is, I have obligations. You know, they weren't, they weren't born with these mindsets, they were taught them. We can teach the mindset that we're all born with obligations to take care of our nest. But we've got to start now. It doesn't mean that you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you can save it where, where you live. And I like this approach because it empowers each one of us. Right now, most of us feel totally powerless uh, in, in addressing any one of the huge environmental issues that we, we have. Uh, but you, as a single person, can walk out tomorrow, plant an acorn, plant an oak tree, plant a, a black cherry, any one of the powerhouse plants, or put in a pollinator garden, shrink your lawn, do that as a single individual. Then we can measure the conservation benefits that you have, have just given us. Uh, that's positive reinforcement. You'll do it again. All of us become important players in the future of conservation, essential players in the future of conservation. It also shrinks the, the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't think about the entire Earth's problems. That, that is not manageable. Think about your little piece of the Earth. If you own a piece of the Earth, or if you don't own it, you can volunteer in your nearest park or preserve. You can do those things. You can help shrink that lawn. You can put in those, those keystone plants, put in the pollinator garden. What's the last thing you need to do? I don't know, those thing, three things would be, be good. Um, remember, 85% of the, of, the, of the country's uh, privately owned. If you do it, if everybody who owns property does that, we're 85% done. So as property owners or as volunteers, each one of us has the power. We certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we, we decide to do so is going to determine nature's fate. Now, I've already convinced my grandchildren that you are nature's best hope. Whether or not I've convinced you, um, we'll see. Thanks a lot for listening. Thank you very much, Doug. That was really, really interesting. Take a glass of water. You've earned it. Yeah, a glass of water. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. So, um, if you would like to maybe stop your screen sharing, there we go. There we go. Um, so we did have some questions come in via the chat, and we'll get to some of those. You already covered one of mine, which is, you know, you talked about plants that you have in on your property in Pennsylvania, um, whether whether that's appropriate here in Wisconsin, um, or you know anywhere. But it sounds like. Native versus non-native isn't quite as important, as you said, as compared to productive versus unproductive. So um, yeah, interesting there. So um, just a reminder, if you do have a question for Doug, uh, if you hover your cursor down toward the bottom of your screen, you'll see a button that says chat. You can open that up and um, type your question out and um, we'll hopefully be able to share with Doug. So. Um, let's see. So one of our questions, Doug, we here in Wisconsin are, of course, and you are as well, coming uh, on, into the fall season. Are there things that people can do in their yards now, this fall, to perhaps get them ready for next year or even something that could be um, beneficial and, and sort of do its thing over winter? Are there things that people can do right now this fall? Yeah, absolutely. Um, or let's rephrase that. There's things we shouldn't do that we typically do do. Remember all those, those uh, moth species that are dropping from the tree and spinning cocoons in the leaves? Well, if we rake up all those leaves and burn them or put them out as trash, we've just thrown, thrown those creatures out. It'd be great if you can keep uh, any leaf that falls on your property on your property. You don't have to keep it on your lawn, but remember, you're gonna shrink your lawn, so you'll have more space for those leaves. Leaves are the, the perfect mulch. Uh, so stop buying bark and, and uh, use those leaves. If you run it through your mower and grind it up first, you've, you've just ground up your luna moth and everything else. So try to, try to uh, use the whole leaves. Uh, my son brought a, a house 
a couple of years ago and he called me up and he said, uh, he said, dad, I've got way too many leaves. I don't know what to do with all my leaves and not a place to put them. I said, rake them into your, your beds. He said, I don't have enough beds. I said, exactly. That is the way you shrink your yard. Put beds around each one of your trees and you will have space for your, for your leaves. Um, and a lot of people say, well, I, you know, I can't, my, my, all my plants won't grow up to three feet of leaves. That's true, uh, but it, it, they settle down and don't put that many on. Or start a compost pile if you have too many leaves. Sell them to your neighbors. There's always a shortage of those wonderful things. Um, other things that people uh, like to do in the fall is mow down any little meadow they might have to neaten it up. Well, those are the stems that, that a lot of our bees overwinter in, even though they, they look dead. They essentially are dead. The plant's living be below the ground, but that's where um, uh, many bees uh, will spend the winter. Um, so you've just eliminated that. You've also eliminated uh, the seeds that, that many of our overwintering birds, our sparrows, our juncos and things, live off of. Um, all winter long. Not every bird goes to a bird feeder, by the way. You'll notice you don't have sparrows at your bird feeder. So um, they're depending on the seeds in those plants. So the time to neaten up that meadow is, is um, early spring, not the fall. Those are a couple things that, that you should consider. Great. Um, and when it comes to natives, um, a couple of people asked uh, for your perspective on and this is a term I'm not familiar with, cultivars of native plants, cultivars instead of natives. I assume you know what that is. Uh, <laughs> could you explain that and, and how cultivars compare to natives? Um, well, a cultivar is a genetic variant of a particular species. And the horticulture industry likes to enhance traits that we like. So um, make the flower bigger or prettier, um, they created echinacea that look like zinnias. And cultivars allow us to, to make plants uh, similar to the fashion industry. Every year you change the fashion so that people will buy new clothes. Every year we come up with new cultivars so that people will buy, buy new plants. And that's all come from the idea that plants are just decorations. So if you're only buying plants to decorate, then, then you know, that, that works. And that's what we've really done for the last, last century. Uh, but with this new way of thinking, we're going to buy plants for not just because they look good, but because they're functional. So the question is, does turning a, uh, you know, creating a cultivar of a native plant inhibit its ecological function? And the answer is, it depends. It depends on what the cultivar trait was that was enhanced. Now, a lot of cultivars are just natural variants that are found in nature. Somebody found, for example, somebody found a, a red maple, Acer rubrum, that was particularly red in the fall and they, they cloned it and called it Acer rubrum October glory. It wasn't selected by any, any human. It was a natural variant uh, and then sold it as a, as a cultivar. And there are a lot of cultivars like that, but others are purposely selected. We actually did a study comparing six common cultivar traits that had nothing to do with flowers on woody plants. So for example, um, what happens when you take a green leaf and turn it red or purple? What happens when it's a variegated leaf? What happens when you take a tall plant and make it short? When you introduce disease resistance, things like that. And the only trait that um, consistently reduced insect use was taking a green leaf and making it red or purple. And that's because it loads those leaves with anthocyanins that are feeding deterrents. Now, Annie White at the University of Vermont has been looking at what happens when you change different flower traits uh, and there the news isn't quite as good uh, there because of all those specialized bees. When you start fooling with flowers, you immediately mess up the specialized re interaction that that bee, particular bee has with that particular flower species. Um, so generalist uh, bees are, are better at handing different different cultivars, but uh, specialist bees often often suffer from it. What I don't like uh, about most cultivars is that they're propagated clonally meaning there's zero genetic variability in them. And in today's wild climate uh, fluctuations that we have, we need as much genetic variability as possible in our populations. Uh, so, uh, you know, go to your nursery. If you're looking for a straight species that we know has ecological value, ask for it. And if they don't have it, ask them to get it. And if they hear that enough, they will get it. The, the, the nursery industry is recognizing that the, the native plant 
section of what they sell is, you know, it's burgeoning. They can't keep up with it. Everybody wants these plants. So, um, so it's, it's a, you know, it's a, uh, it's a growth industry. Uh, and a lot of people are are taking advantage of that. So so don't don't give up. Don't say okay, I'll take the cultivar if you don't want it. Um, it'll come along. Market driven. Great, thank you. Um, and before we move on to the next question, um, we've had a few questions on um, some people joined us late. Um, questions whether there will be a video of this presentation. There will. We are recording this and. Um, Next week, we will get this up on the Central Wisconsin Book Festival YouTube page. So if you've missed it, um, we'll, we'll spread the word um, once videos are from this festival are uploaded. So you can watch them anytime, share them with your friends, all of that good stuff. Um, another question, um, how will I know that I am supporting enough caterpillars? How many caterpillars is enough <laughs> to know that we're doing the right thing? Uh, well, you know, you're never going to go out and count all those caterpillars. As a matter of fact, it's very tough to count caterpillars at important times because the birds have already eaten them. Um, so you'd have to you'd have to exclude the birds and count them. The best way to know is to put in the plants we know support a lot of caterpillars, and that's what that native plant finder is all about. Just pick, make sure you have representatives of those top genera, and you will be making enough caterpillars. So the 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 Examples I gave you in the beginning were to try to convince you that um, if we use these plants, the insects come and they will come un unless they're extinct. So we got to do it before they're extinct, but um, they're really good at finding uh, host plants. So all you have to worry about is using those top producing plants and you'll be making enough caterpillars. Great. And uh, so let's see here. Um, so we had a question from somebody who lives in a condo and has uh, just kind of some small pots around the house. Um, are there plants that um, do well and possibly attract caterpillars that fit in a pot? And my own question, based on this person's question, is whether it's possible or is it okay for somebody this may be a dumb question, but can you just, can you buy caterpillars somewhere and like kind of start your own in a pot at home or so first, first question, are there um, plants that do well in small pots that would attract caterpillars and can you get something going on your own if, if not? Uh, the answer is yes, absolutely. Um, I have, I have seen uh, Joe Pye, the, there's a uh, Little Joe, they call it. It's a shorter, shorter species of uh, Joe Pye weed grown in pots very effectively. They have a wonderful bloom and um, a lot of pollinators come to those, those blooms. But milkweeds are another great option for, for potted plants. Monarchs are one of our most mobile uh, insects and they, you know, they fly thousands of miles north and thousands of miles south. They will stop at your pot. They will lay eggs on them. You will have monarch caterpillars uh, pretty much anywhere you, you do that. Um, so uh, that's a good thing to start with, but we need a lot more uh, experimentation with what will do well in pots and, and still function as viable host plants and what will use it. Very few people have done that. So that, that'd be a great project for some of your, your kids. Um, can you buy caterpillars? Actually, you can from, from biological supply houses. They're mostly used for, for school programs. Um, I would not, I do not suggest buying caterpillars like Painted Lady and rearing them and then letting them go. Uh, these are really, they're domesticated, they've been highly inbred and they may be carrying diseases and things. We don't want to release them outside. So it's much better to put the plant again and see what comes. You know, another one that, that happens all the time is uh, black swallowtail on your parsley or your dill. People, you know, have those in pots all the time and they say, oh, Look at these caterpillars, beautiful caterpillar. Um, that's very entertaining. All right, um, next question. Do you need to cut the perennial stems down part way to make the stem accessible to insects or leave the entire dry plant whole? Uh, Heather Holm has discovered that most of the nesting occurs within two feet of the ground. You can cut it off uh, above that uh, it does open up 
Um, I mean, it makes access probably a little bit easier, but obviously you don't need to do that. Nobody was cutting them off a thousand years ago and they, they managed to use it. But, um, but cutting it off can reduce the, the unsightliness of some of these plants. Uh, and if you leave uh, a foot and a half or, or two feet, um, the bees still will use it, yes. But if you cut it off in the, in the fall, you've, any seeds that are above that, of course, are no, no longer available for the, the birds. So there is a loss there. But cutting them off in the spring when those seeds are already gone, no problem. I personally am really intrigued by the, the idea of the layered landscape um, and something might perhaps try in our own yard. But we did have a question from uh, an attendee. How large an area of soil and plants should be around our pin oak? Or, you know, maybe in general, if you're talking about a layered landscape, um, how big of an area around the base of the tree um, is, is productive? guess. Uh, yeah, this is definitely a case where the bigger the better. But I, I would look at your yard. Start with that concept of reducing the lawn. So the way to reduce the lawn is to grow your beds. You want to, the lawn you preserve ought to be in swaths, broad swaths that you can walk through. Um, and you know, I'm talking about at, at least 10, 15 feet. Uh, but they curve and they guide you through your landscape so you can appreciate what what is there. Uh, once you've laid that out, you can see where the beds have have to be. The, how big they are will depend on, on the size of your property. Remember the picture of the, the giant lawn I showed you there? Those beds would be pretty big if we cut that area in, in half. How big does it have to be for the health of the pin oak? Um, again, the bigger the better. The, uh, trees actually hate grass underneath them. They they compete with water. Uh, there's always lawnmower damage, and it uh, hurts the roots. And there's no no uh, leaves returning nutrients to the soil. So anytime you can cover an entire root system with healthy forest floor like that, the tree's going to love it. Okay, great. Um, let me see. Um, just trying to listening. Um, let's see, let's go down. Um, and we, you've touched on this a little bit already, but for anyone who, who uh, missed it, um, one comment and then question, I am working on increasing the natives in my yard. I have several plants that are well established, non-natives that still attract multiple pollinators, e.g. hydrangea, sedum, etc. How do I decide what should be replaced with natives? Um, but going back to your, your point before, should they be replaced by natives? Do they have to be replaced by natives? Well, there are no non-natives that are more productive than the productive natives. So you can always increase the productivity by putting in some of those keystone species. But if you have, you know, if you have well-established healthy plants, um, replacing them uh, when they die is a good approach. So through attrition, um, a lot of people look at the, the use of plants only from the perspective of pollinators. What is visiting these plants? Uh, that is a perspective, but remember pollinators are not driving the food web. It's those caterpillars that are driving the food web. So hydrangea, for example, has almost no caterpillars on it at all, even though some, some pollinators will go to the flowers. So there's there's a trade-off. If you have a, a yard where you look at the leaves, none of the leaves have any holes eaten in them, you're not supporting a, a viable food web, even though you may be helping some some pollinators. So you want to balance. You want to have the food web. You want to have you want to have the pollinator garden. Um, and whether you can do both of them will depend on the size of your yard, how much sun you have, and and things like that. A lot of People should look at their entire neighborhood. This is a good chance to meet your neighbors and all work together because your neighborhood together certainly will have enough land where you could hit all the bases. But if somebody has a big spreading oak tree in their yard, they probably don't have enough sun for a good pollinator garden. Should we put that, cut down the oak tree so you can have a pollinator garden? No, you shouldn't let the neighbor who's got a lot of sun have the pollinator garden. Work together as a unit. 
When you were planting your property, um, did you deal have have to deal with deer at all? One thing in Wisconsin that we have a lot of, or perhaps not enough of, depending on who you ask, is deer. And deer, one question that we had this evening, how to deal with the deer, which most of the time eat, like to eat our natives. They sure um, do. They sure do. do. It's, a terrible problem. It's, a, it's a problem that persists every day. Uh, yeah, we got a lot of deer. Our our county at one point had we had 14 times the carrying capacity of deer. So there should be about 10 deer per square mile. We had uh, 140 per square mile. And you're, you're, uh, the, whoever it was is absolutely right. If you don't protect the native plants, they nail them. Deer are one of the major reasons that we have serious invasive plants in our our natural areas because the deer eat all the natives that pop up and there's and they hate the invasives so that gives the invasives a serious competitive edge so what do we do about deer well we know what to do about deer but most people don't want to do that so if if you're just worried about your yard what i did we got 10 acres i wasn't about to fence the 10 acres that's a huge expense and a huge undertaking um, so I, I have wire cages, um, galvanized wire cages, five feet high, uh, that are wide enough that I could put it around my, my baby tree without constraining the growth of the branches at all. And then as it grew bigger, I'd increase the size of the, of the cage until the, the what I, I call the graduation day, where I could take the cage off and they are now big enough that the deer cannot kill them. There is a stage though, when the, the uh, trunk is about this thick, that they're vulnerable to buck rubbing. So even though they're too tall for the deer to eat the leader and, and all the leaves, the buck can get the uh, velvet off of its antlers in the fall right now, this is when they're doing it, and strip the bark and that will kill the tree as well. So I would wrap it with old plastic fencing that I wasn't using just one, one time around and then the, the buck won't, won't do that. Um, it's too bad. Uh, it's, it's a, uh, you know, it's, it's extra work. It makes putting these things back um, harder than it would be. But we've gotten rid of all the deer predators, except for the car, and that's, that's an inefficient one. Um, and, and, you know, it's not the deer's fault. And we've also created perfect deer habitat. They like edge, and we, everything's an edge now. So we have a very unhealthy situation with more deer than the environment could sustain. Um, and, we're, and we're losing recruitment in our forests because of it. So uh, you can put those plants back on your property by moving cages around. Yeah, the cages are ugly, I know, but so is a dead tree, so. <laughs> All right, I think we got time for one or two more. Yeah. Um, You've talked about the importance of oaks. Um, are all oaks equal, or is any species of oak better for more varieties of caterpillars? When you go on Native Plant Finder, you'll find that everything is at the genus level. So you'll see Quercus, but it doesn't tell you which oaks are better than other oaks, and that's because nobody studied that. If, if, you, if you go in the literature and look at what um, a lot of these caterpillars eat, most of the time the host records say, oaks. They don't tell us which oak it was it was on. So I actually have a student working on that right now. Um, but we have 90 species of oaks in the, the country and nobody has compared all those. Of course, you don't have 90 in any one one place. I suspect and this is this is just, you know, gestalt my observation that the white oak group has a little bit of an edge over the red oak group. So things like white oak and post oak and bur oak swamp white oak, uh, those, those things uh, might support a little bit more than pin oak and red oak and turkey oak. Um, but oaks defend themselves with tannins and the insects that are adapted to eating tannins um, can eat a lot of plants that have tannins in them. So most of the oak eaters probably can eat both of those, those groups. Uh, and there's probably the, the, the end result of, of the study we're doing now is going to probably show that there's very little difference. One thing I will mention, a very popular oak in the trade right now is swamp white oak, but its leaves are quite thick and quite hairy compared to others. And my guess is that discourages a lot of insect use. So out of the oaks, 
the one that's being pushed right now is probably the one that's going to be eaten the least. So. Uh, gotcha, gotcha. All right. Um, well, let's see. I think there's more questions than we'll have time to get to this evening, of course. Um, but in talking about, you mentioned working with your neighbors. Um, one question, and we'll make it our final one for the evening. What about neighbors that spray for mosquitoes and ticks? My pollinators have declined dramatically. Any compromises like time of day for spraying? Do you have any recommendations for neighbors working together <laughs> in that regard? The, the mosquito spraying issue is a huge one all over the country. Um, the, you know, when Zika virus moved into Florida, actually it never did, it was people carrying it and it never got established. All of a sudden that, that um, and then we had West Nile before that, that spawned this giant mosquito Joe industry where they go around, they just fog everything. Um, there's two things they will tell you. They say, well, this product we're, we're spraying is a natural product, therefore it's okay. Uh, it is, it's, it's pyrethroids, it's from plants, um, but uh, what's your definition of okay? Cyanide is natural too, um, but it's not okay. Uh, <laughs> And they'll say, well, it only kills mosquitoes. No, that's not at all true. It kills all the insects that it comes in contact with. So when you fog something and it floats and on the wind, it floats, it's definitely going from your neighbor's yard to, to your yard. Do they have the right to kill the insects you're trying to, to raise? You know, this is, this is a social issue. The frustrating thing is fogging mosquitoes doesn't work. If it worked, they don't have to do it once. It only kills about 10% of the, the uh, adult mosquito population. You need, to, you need to kill 90% of the adults to get control. So the best way to, to control mosquitoes is in the larval stage. And the, the best product, although it's not perfect, is something we call mosquito dunks. Um, it's, a, it's Bacillus thuringiensis. So it's a, it's a little, you can get it at the hardware store, it's a little round disc. And put a bucket, get a bucket and fill it full of water and put some hay or straw in and let it ferment for a couple of days. And that becomes irresistible to mosquitoes that are gravid, that are pregnant. They will lay their eggs in that bucket. The eggs hatch, then you put in your mosquito dung, the larvae feed on the, the bacillus syringansis. It's a disease and it kills aquatic dipterans. So in your bucket, the aquatic dipterans will be mosquitoes. Now, if you just throw them randomly in, in um, aquatic natural areas, you're gonna kill a lot of other aquatic diptera too, particularly chironomids, uh, midges that don't bite, but they're important aspects of, of your, your system. So I suggest do it in your buckets. If everybody had a mosquito dunk bucket, you wouldn't be hitting dragonflies or anything else. Uh, you'd just be getting those mosquitoes and it'd be a lot more effective and a lot cheaper than mosquito Joe and it wouldn't kill any of your caterpillars. So that's my suggestion. All right. Well, since Doug is an hour ahead of us, it's getting later in the evening. Um, so I'm afraid we'll, we'll have to, I'm sorry, we've, we've kept you long enough. Um, once again, there will be a recording of the event available soon through the Central Wisconsin Book Festival. Um, you'll also find on the Book Festival website, which is mcpl.us slash cwbf, there's a survey there. If you'd like to give us some feedback, let us know what you thought about this event this evening. And um, otherwise, we'll call it good. Doug, thank you so much. We've had some great comments on the chat. One person suggested we should put you on instead of the presidential debates. Um, I want to hear, hear the debates. <laughs> so everyone can learn something. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for joining us this evening and, and sharing so much great information with us. You are and quite welcome. Thank you to all of you who have tuned in. Um, this is the first event of the book festival. We'll have events tomorrow through Sunday. So um, check us out on Facebook. Again, the festival website, mcpl.us slash cwbf. And we'll call it there. Thank you very much once again, Doug. Appreciate it. Thanks. Good night. Have a good evening, everybody.